Good evening. Glad to see all of you back this evening. Uh, as for me and my house, the sickness continues. Uh, Megan uh, talked to her before just a little while ago, and she was still at a clinic. I didn't realize there were any clinics that were open on Sunday, but evidently there are. And uh, so she took Zayden there, and uh, he has a nice rash broke out on him. So I encourage you to stay away from me. So I will not be shaking hands again this evening because I don't want anyone to get sick. And so I will be staying at a, at a distance from everybody. We're going to continue a series that we started last Sunday night. And we were looking at what is not our authority in religion. And last time we, we spoke about the Pope. And the Pope is not our authority in religion and our lesson centered around looking at, I believe, eight reasons why Peter was not the Pope. And so continuing the idea or the series of what is not our authority in religion, we're going to be looking at the conscience. Oh, there's a lot of people that want to say that conscience is their guide in religion. Now, they may not use that exact phraseology, but it is really what they believe. And when you think about popular religious culture people will say well just just let your conscience be your guide and what this does is it promotes a religion that is based upon feelings instead of being based upon what god has actually revealed or what god has actually said it's based upon individual feelings and that will be ultimately their guide and, and often there is one particular passage that is used to kind of justify this principle. And it's found in Romans chapter 14. And it is a passage that is misused. And I did put that on the screen so that you understand. Uh, this passage in no way justifies the idea or principle that we should allow conscience to be our guide in religion. But this is a place that often those that have that belief will run to or go to. And the passage, Romans 14, verse 5, the last part of that says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And so you need to be fully persuaded in your own mind. I'll be fully persuaded in my own mind. And it doesn't matter whether we agree. And it doesn't matter if what we believe contradicts. You go your way, I go my way, and we're all going to be okay. And uh, the idea is that they're going to allow their own feelings or their own conscience to guide them, and that's going to be right for them. And if it guides you in a different direction, so be it. We'll just all go in different directions, but we're all going to the same location. Now, I've not heard of people going in separate directions and all ending up in the same place. It doesn't work that way. Uh, if I'm trying to give directions and you go north and I go south, we're not going to end up in the same place. Uh, that doesn't... It doesn't work. And so, again, but that, that's the principle that often is used. The other part of that passage is in verse 22, which says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And so, your faith is between you and your God, and, and it's not, it doesn't ha really have anything to do with anybody else, and we don't have to agree as long as you feel good. And again, it goes back to emotions. As long as you feel good about what you think your relationship with God is and your emotions drive that, then you must be okay. It's not based upon any objective standard. It's not based upon any information that God has revealed. It's just based upon how you feel. And if you wake up feeling, well, you know, I'm saved or I'm good with God, then that is how you proceed. But does this mean that really anything is acceptable as long as my conscience doesn't bother me after I do it? At least that's what some people might think. I mean, are we really to determine truth personally? That on each, it's up to each individual as to what truth really is. I mean, some people really believe this. They believe, well, what is truth for me? It's not necessarily truth to you. And even to the point that they would say that truth can contradict is Every man, a law unto himself. Is that really the way that it is supposed to be? And is that acceptable to Almighty God? That every individual is a law unto himself. And that a person can do whatever is right in their own eyes. And that that's okay. That God's going to accept that. Well, God has never accepted that. 
And we find that even in the day of Judges, those individuals that were doing what was right in their own eyes was not acceptable. And it's never been acceptable. And yet there are people today that are trying to get us to believe that this is what's right. And so a subjective standard, what that does is it produces confusion. And we can see that this is not a biblical concept. God is not the author of confusion. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33 teaches this principle. God is not the author of confusion. He's not going to allow that to go forward. And so it's not going to be up to the individual, but it's going to be up to Him. And that is the way that God has determined what truth is because He is truth. And truth is based from Him. Truth flows from Him. And so we have to have that truth that comes from Him. In James chapter 3, 15 and 16, we find that confusion doesn't come from God. Confusion comes from the other side. Confusion comes from Satan. And the Bible says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Which the idea there is, is where every evil work is, and envy and strife, that's where there is confusion. That doesn't come from God. Those things that are evil. And so we can see that actually would come from Satan. And so in religion, there's the idea that conscience can be our guide. And you know what that's created? That's created a lot of confusion, a lot of discord, where you have all these different people that are trying to follow what they would call their inner voice that's telling them things. Or at least that's what they have been led to believe. And so it's leading them to do things that are contrary to what God has actually said. And so that is a big problem. When we talk about morals, when we have individuals that saying, going around telling people that they are to let conscience be their guide, then that causes all kinds of immorality when people say that. Instead of following God's standard of authority for what is right and what's wrong, what's moral and what's immoral, if you say, well, just leave it up to yourself, leave it up to your conscience, boy, that'll get you in trouble every time. Ernest Hemingway said this, what is moral is what you feel good after. What is immoral is what you feel bad after. Well, that was the standard that he set forward. So as long as you do something, you don't feel bad about it after, then, hey, that must be something that's, that's moral. Oh, that's, that's a very dangerous principle to live by. And so what this would allow is for adults to agree to practice sexual immorality before marriage or outside of their marriage because anything would go. And we know that this is not right. God's will is the standard for our truth. His Word is truth. The Bible says, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy Word is truth. And so we need to go to God who is the objective standard for truth. But why can conscience not be our guide. I'm going to give you three reasons why conscience cannot be our guide as we're trying to rule out those things that are not our standard for religious authority today. There are a lot of people that use all kinds of different things. Manuals, creeds, the Pope, and their conscience or emotions. But we need to know why those things are not our standard because we will inevitably come across individuals when we are talking to them about religion that are going to say the very same things that we've been saying here tonight. You're, you're fine. You go your way. It doesn't really matter. And, and, and I feel that I'm right. I mean, How many of you have entered into a Bible study before and you've sat down with folks and they said, well, I feel I'm saved. I've had that happen so, so, so many times in so many different uh, religious discussions and Bible studies. I feel that I'm saved. Not that I can point to, I know that I'm saved because of, I feel that I'm saved. And because I have this feeling, then I have to be saved. Regardless of what they're doing or what they've done or how they're living. That's unfortunate. And so that's why we must answer this question. Conscience can be undereducated, it can be damaged, and it can be ignored. Those are the three things that we will look at Tonight, number one, it can be undereducated. Now, there are those that they're following their conscience, but their conscience has not been trained properly. It hasn't been really educated based upon truth. 
And it, they have a warped conscience because of that. It's undereducated. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 25, it says, There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but just because it seems right to you, doesn't actually make it right, does it? The Bible says, well, it might seem right to you, and you feel good about it. You feel good about the path that you're on, and it seems so right, but it doesn't make it right because the end is a way of death. So the Bible teaches that principle in John chapter 16 and verse 2. He says here in John 16 and in verse 2, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. You think about that for a moment. There were those during this time that were providing intense persecution to those that truly were Christians. And he says those are individuals that they feel like they're right, so much so that they're going to try to kill some of you and they're going to feel like they're doing what's right. And his point is, they're not. They're not in the right, but they feel like they're in the right. Why? Because they've been taught wrong. They had had not the proper education. Their conscience had not been trained according to what truth was. And because of that, they didn't accept Jesus as Christ and they were persecuting His followers. But they felt good about it. Their conscience was clear. They felt like they were doing God's work. But were they? Well, absolutely not. And so based upon that standard, it's a dangerous one. It led them in the wrong direction. And so even Jesus mentions this, that that's what would happen. Even his enemies would do so, thinking that they were doing what's right, but they're not. If you look at the Apostle Paul, he was one that certainly fulfilled this. And you look at Acts chapter 7 and 8, and you can see that there. But you notice he spoke of his days before his conversion in Acts chapter 26 and verse 9. And the Apostle Paul, he says, Verily, thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, according to his own confession, Paul says this, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He did it, but it was ignorantly in unbelief. Paul says this about himself, and Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. I want you to think about that for a moment. Now, here's somebody that was going around doing wrong. He was going around and killing those that were actually followers of Jesus Christ. They were truly disciples. And they were doing what was right. But Paul was doing this, and he says, I've lived my life in all good conscience for me. His conscience was clear even though he was doing wrong. That tells us if you follow your conscience, it can be a dangerous thing. His conscience had not been taught the truth. And before he knew that truth, and before his conscience had been taught and educated and trained, it led him in the wrong direction to do the wrong thing. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void to offense toward God and toward men. All the while, he kept a good conscience. So the question is, could Paul continue to kill Christians and still have gone to Kevin? Could he have continued to, to kill the Christians in the first century and have gone to heaven? Because he had all good conscience. But did that make him clear before God? Because his conscience was right and it was all clear. Did that make accept him accepted before God? The answer is no. So there are people today that may feel like, oh, I've got a good conscience before God, and they feel like they're right and justified, but that doesn't make them right before God. Even if you have sincerity and you're doing what's wrong, you're still wrong. And so sincerity certainly does not justify. When you look at another example of the Pharisees, and you see how they were teaching people that they did not have to care for the parent, their parents that had become old, that were aging. All they had to do is to, to follow the loophole that they had created, and that they had to give money to the temple. And if they gave money to the temple, then they didn't have to take care of their aging parents. They felt like they, they had come up with this loophole and that they could feel good about doing this. 
When you read in Mark 7, 11, he says, but you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that's what we're talking about, where they, they have this gift, that's what Corban is. That is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. That's the idea. I don't have to take care of my aged parents. All I have to do is give this gift over here, and then I can say, well, I don't have any money. I can't take care of them. So I've done this over here. I have fulfilled my responsibility. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, they felt good about doing that. And did it make them right? No, it did not. Oh, they felt good about it. Even they had religious leaders telling them, this is what you need to do. It didn't make it right. There are a lot of people today that are following religious leaders that are zealously telling them to do something, but it doesn't make their actions right or justified before God. In Matthew chapter 15, 5 and 6, he says, But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honoreth not his father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You voided out the commandment of God. What you've done, you've disobeyed God because you've come up with something that's outside of God's Word, which was a tradition at that day. Something that they had stood up and told people that it was okay to do. He's saying, you've disobeyed God. You've not followed the commandment of God because you follow these religious leaders. And yet you feel good about what you've done. But the teaching is, it was wrong. They had disobeyed the commandment of Almighty God. And so sincerely wrong is still wrong. Another example of that is the Jews. Their conscience did not bother or trouble them, but they had rejected Christ as Savior. I want you to think about that. Those Jews felt justified. They felt like they were justified in putting that Jesus on the cross and they were in that crowd on that day and those Jews were yelling out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! And they felt like they were justified. That their conscience was clear. But they were sincerely wrong. And so Paul writes to them, for I bear them record that they have seal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. A conscience cannot tell one what the truth is. It can only reflect what one has been told is the truth. It's like a, a blinker on a motorcycle or a car. It only flashes when the person that's driving it tells it to flash. They turn it on. And so it is the conscience. If it has not been properly trained, it has not been properly educated, it will reflect in an incorrect manner. Number two, the conscience can be damaged. We see that from Scripture in Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. In Titus chapter 1 verse 15, he says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Now, if you look up the word defiled, it is defined as to taint or to contaminate. So what they had done is they had contaminated their conscience and their mind. Their, their conscience had been damaged. It had been contaminated. I mean, do we really want to rely upon a conscience that's been contaminated to tell us whether something is right or wrong? We should look to a holy God for that truth and not try to rely upon our own conscience which can be damaged. You see in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 through 4, he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now the phrase seared with a hot iron is kind of like what we would call branded. You know, when you got your cattle, you bring them up and you got your mark and you get that, that brand that you've made so they know it's your cattle. You got that thing just hot as can be and you just, you just stick it on the side of that cattle, you know, that cow. That heifer, and just, I mean, it just sends, it singes in there. It's stuck there for good. Your sign, you've made your mark. You've branded it. And so when you actually look at the original, the root of the original word that's used here, it is to set on fire. 
which ultimately would mean to brand, we get our word to carterize. We use that in medical terms. They're going to go in and carterize this or that. That's where we get that word from, from the Greek word that is used here, seared with a hot iron. And so by implication, it means to render insensitive. When we brand animals, they don't feel that pain in that place where it's been branded because that part of the skin has been made to feel no pain. That means the nerve endings have been damaged in that place. We understand that. But that's what happens to our conscience. That over time, our conscience can come to a point where it has been carterized, it has been branded, it has been damaged, it has become insensitive. It no longer functions as it should function. It is now damaged. And it is a dangerous thing to put all of our weight for eternity upon a damaged conscience. And so we need to be very careful. Perhaps some people no longer have a working conscience. Psychologists, they say that some people no longer have a conscience. They speak of serial killers that show no remorse. You've got young people that can go into classes and classrooms and seemingly follow through with mass murders and feel no wrong, no regret. No conscience. There's no evidence that Adolf Hitler experienced a guilty conscience during his life, even though he tormented and did atrocious things to the Jewish people and many others, almost 50 million that suffered through the wake of all of the things that took place there. Joseph Stalin is another. And yet, you think about all those things and all those individuals, and yet, they did it and they felt just fine. They were following. Their, their conscience didn't bother them a bit, if you, if you can see what I mean. Yet they were dead wrong. So we have individuals that are following their conscience. And it's not just criminals who can sear their conscience. Christians do the same. And we do that in a lot of different ways and we need to be very careful how we allow our consciences to be seared. I would say that over a very short amount of time, I've seen even in my lifetime, things transition quickly in a country that would say, for example, the one that comes to my mind would be uh, homosexuality and, uh, and to see how it would transition to where that was something that you really talk, you didn't talk about. It was definitely something that would be shunned and, and recognized as, as a sinful behavior. And yet over time, what's happened? What's happened? Just watching a cartoon before coming over here, had the kids, we're sitting there, it was on the TV, and then I'm watching this cartoon, right? And there it is. On the cartoon, I could not believe what I was seeing. Now, the kids, I don't know they picked it up. I don't even think they picked up on it. But you got two male birds, and they're having this whatever, this tango and this dance, and that, that's exactly what was happening. And, and uh, I can't even tell. I don't even know what the, the name of the movie is. It's going to the trash as soon as I get home. <laughs> now that I know that, I had no idea. And yet, it's being put in cartoons. It's being put before our minds and we think nothing of it. We turn on the television. We're going to watch these uh, shows, these series with homosexuals and we're going to support it and we're going to be fine buying material that has it in it and support it. And yet, what's happened? Our conscience has become seared over time. If it can happen with that, just think of all the other ways it can happen. You know, it's the same thing with the relationships and marriages in which people felt like holding the marriage together was the best thing and, and they would strive to do that. And today, people don't even try to enter into marriage. They'll just live in a, an illicit sexual relationship outside of marriage. They don't even try to get married. Because why? Well, we've just come to the point where we accept that. And it's not even a big deal anymore. Those things have slowly crept in and our conscience has become seared. And so we have to be so so very careful. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, it says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It is possible for our conscience to be damaged. It's possible for our consciences to be ignored. For us to just overlook them, we can actually deceive ourselves according to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. He says, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And actually in James 1.22, again, he says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. It's possible to do that. To ignore what we know to be right. 
And when we look at Proverbs 16 and verse 2, he says, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. We, we think, oh, it's okay. We're just going to ignore. What we think is right, we're going to choose. I mean, we can make anything justified. I mean, we can come up with a good reason to do something wrong in almost any circumstance, can't we? We do it, don't we? He says, well, we'll, we'll come up, we'll, we'll make anything clean in our own eyes. We'll just overlook our conscience. We'll come up with a rationale that makes anything right. But the Lord is the one who says what's right or wrong, right or wrong. He will weigh the hearts and the spirits. Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 12, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. I want you to think about that. They're right in their own perception, but from God's perception they're not. So we have to be so, so very careful. Not all consciences are safe guides for behavior because they have not been trained. It's important to note also as we conclude our lesson, we draw it to a close, and looking at what is not our standard, that certainly our conscience is not that standard. The conscience can be seared. We need to be careful to make sure that doesn't happen. But the conscience can be retrained. And that's something that's also very important. Because there's a lot of people that come with a lot of baggage. And not every single one of us, we've come out of sin to come to Christ. Every single one of us needed Christ. We needed salvation. We needed forgiveness because we had sin. And so there are a lot of people that come from a, a lot of sin in their background. And they come to Christ in great need, needing that forgiveness. And that means that they have been living in a lot of sin. It's going to be challenging for them. But their conscience can be retrained. They can get into the book. They can put that book into their mind, put it into their heart, so that it reflects what is truth, what is right, so that their conscience can reflect what is right. And so we have to understand that. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14, it says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They've worked very diligently to do so. What are we going to do? Are we going to allow our conscience to be seared away so that it doesn't reflect even closely the Word of God or the truth that is found therein? Are we going to work very diligently to make sure that God's Word is where it should be in our life so that our conscience is not burned away so that it does reflect what is right? We must constantly meditate upon the Word of God. The psalmist says we do so so that we might not sin against the God of heaven. That we hide the Word in our heart so that we might not do that. And that is how our conscience will reflect truth if we put it in our hearts and in our minds. So by conclusion, we say, well, we're not going to follow our conscience and say, we don't need to know what God's Word says, and we don't need to know what the objective standard of God's Word says, we're only going to follow our conscience. And we're going to set this Word down, don't need it, we're just going to follow our feelings, we're going to follow our emotions, we're going to follow our conscience. No, we're not going to do that. And you know why? For these three reasons, we may not be trained right, or we may not have given time and attention to put the truth of God's Word there, we may not have received the right information, so we need to be careful about that. Our conscience may be damaged, and we can even get to a point where we just forget about it. We ignore what we know is to be right. So we don't need to rely upon that. What we need to rely upon for right and wrong is God's Word. If you're not a Christian, why not tonight? Give your life to the Savior that loved you and that died on the cross for you so that you might have hope of eternal life. Will you not believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world? Will you not tonight turn away from wickedness and sin to serve Jesus Christ in repentance? Will you not tonight with your lips confess that Jesus is the Chosen One, the Savior of the world, the Son of God? With your lips confess that fact. Will you not do that tonight? Will you not be baptized? So that all your past can be washed away so that you can rise to walk in a new life as a new creature in Jesus Christ. 
That you can bury the old man to rise to walk in that life. Romans 6, 3 through 6. You can do that tonight. Maybe you've not been living as you should. You need to come back to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You need to be restored. You can do that. We can pray with you and for you if you need to be restored tonight. We have an invitation song prepared. Won't you come? As together we stand and as we sing.